Christ Community Church, located at 25th and Thomas Avenue in Portsmouth, Ohio. Imagine a church where every member is passionately, wholeheartedly, and recklessly calling the shots. I don't know who sets the worship center temperature, but why does it have to be so cold? Why do you have to be so right? Heated chairs are now being installed. This one wants a small church, but I'm afraid if it's too small, they're gonna make me volunteer like crazy. And I don't stack chairs, <laughs> do I? Makes total sense. Join now and we'll let you decide the size of our church. We're millennials and we want a church that- Say no more. Any requests you have will be granted immediately. <laughs> Parking is horrible. It takes me almost six minutes to get from my car to the building. Ugh. It's gonna take me six seconds to tell you a valet service is on the way. My pastor's preaching, it's all over the map. I say, oh, I don't know, stick with the books of the Bible. We should be only exegetical. Okay, next week we start John chapter one, verse one. And we'll even start pronouncing that word the way you said it. Hey, I'd like this sermon to be no longer than 30 minutes. How does 15 minutes sound? Hey, anybody willing to go 15 should be willing to go to 10. <laughs> you drive a hard bargain. But from now on, five minute sermons it is. <laughs> now you're talking. Me Church, where it's all about you. We're talking about <clears throat> the second chapter of the book of Proverbs. <clears throat> Proverbs is a collection of the wisdom and the knowledge of who at that time was considered the wisest man on the face of the earth simply because God had given him that gift. When he declined to say that he wanted wealth and power, but wisdom, God granted him all three. Solomon had many wives, concubines, many sons. But the one son that was going to be his heir apparent <clears throat> was a guy named Rehoboam. And so it's to him we think that uh, he's addressing these comments. I wish that you all would read the text before you come to church. It would really make a lot more sense to you what I'm getting ready to say this morning if you had just carefully read these 22 verses. He talks about wisdom, and I promised you in writing that I would introduce you to a really, really important lady. Her name is Sophia. And she's here because Sophia is the English word for wisdom. Wisdom. Wisdom is so important that we seldom even talk about it to our own detriment. For instance, we have in our culture a thirst for knowledge. The young people in our day and age have immediate access to an immense amount of knowledge. It's called Google. They don't ask their parents they don't ask their grandparents, they just Google it. Google is the source of a lot, a lot of knowledge. And I'll be honest, I use it myself. It's a quick access to a lot of stuff. I've gone to a doctor before and, and they'd check me out and then they would get on and Google stuff for themselves. I could have done that at home and saved me some money, but uh, I didn't. So that knowledge is here, but knowledge without wisdom is potentially extremely dangerous. Potentially. For instance, if we look back through history, and that's what I've done most of my life, 
the most recent time when you would see uh, how obviously dangerous it can be is during, say, from 1930 to 1945. I was born in 1937. The Nazi empire developed, and without question, in Germany, where the brightest people on the face of the earth and the most knowledgeable, especially in the fields of science. The Soviet Union would never have amounted to a row of peas if they had not have kept the German scientists that they took control of during the Second World War. President Eisenhower made, in my, in my opinion, terrible mistake by waiting till the Soviets came in and took over most of Berlin and a lot of other, uh, the, all of East Germany. Then they took those, those sites, because the Soviets weren't, they're just a lot of them, a great old big country, and they were pretty crude and rude. Bill Sharp, who attended here for many years before he died, was the highest ranking American officer in Berlin at the night the Germans, or rather the Russians, came in and took over. He said you could hear the screaming and the horrible stuff going on from his compound. They were crude and horrible. And they were, in the, they were getting even with the Germans. Then they took all of those German scientists and use them to develop the power, military and scientific, of the Soviet Union. Now, we can't brag about that. We can't condemn them because we did exactly the same thing. We took the people who developed the atomic bomb and a lot of other stuff that went with it, came here to the United States, and actually developed a lot of our scientific area, in, in, especially in the field uh, that had anything to do with military. The point is this. All of that knowledge without wisdom is potentially really dangerous. And so Solomon is talking to his son, and later on, he had many sons, by the way. You can't have that many wives and not have a whole bunch of kids. And when you get over to chapter 4, if you look at the first verse, it'll actually say there, Listen, my sons, plural. But in this particular chapter, he's addressing his remarks to his heir apparent, Rehoboam. And he starts off, and, and he makes the tie between wisdom and knowledge, because he's a wise man. He said, my son... If you accept my words, and that's a big if, because the truth of the matter is he didn't. Most kids don't. We try to help our kids to avoid the same stupidity that we went through ourselves. Instead of listening to us, they go to the source of knowledge without wisdom called Google. I'm not going to give up on that. If you accept my words and store up my commands within you, turning your ear to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding. What do you do with wisdom? And if you call out for insight and cry aloud or yell for understanding, and if you look at, look for it, with, and this is Scott Rawlings' interpretation. And if you look for it with the same intensity that you seek after silver or money, and search for it as a hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find knowledge of God. Wisdom and knowledge of God equals. It's like two equals two. Wisdom equals. And knowledge of God is the same thing. Now with that, with that little background, because I'm not going to read the rest of the chapter, I will only allude to it. 
My opinion is, and this is just one man's opinion, based on pretty careful observation, is that the state of the church in Portsmouth, Ohio, in the USA, and in the world. In my opinion, the single word that, that describes the state of the church today is complacency. We are pretty good at collecting knowledge. But we're not very good at using that knowledge with the input of the Holy Spirit on a continual basis. The result of that is that the church's influence in our world today is minimal, to say the least. And as a result of that, we're moving into, on an international basis, a very scary time. The enemies of this country, China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea, and some other places that uh, do not take that stance but are still on the other side of the fence from where we are, are providing nuclear knowledge and power in the hands of people who, when it comes to wisdom, totally lack of it, but who are in search of power to rule the world. And it's scary. So if I'm right, and we're, we have access to wonderful knowledge, but God's input is limited, to say the least, in all of these circumstances, we live in scary times. What can we do about it? Well, we have to begin with ourselves. I have friends in Washington that I trust and I listen to them. I have friends in the Pentagon that I have known for years and I listen to them. And when they're not, when there's no one around that they have to be answerable to, they'll tell you. These are perilous times. So where do we begin? Well, we begin with ourselves, I think. And I think we need to commit to one another and to our God that we will seek his knowledge, seek his guidance on every single thing that we do in our life. No exceptions. None. So I'm saying at the outset, if you follow along in the outline, and by the way, there's, a, there's one mistake in the outline that you need to know about, and that's, that's down um, in the second one there where it says seek wisdom with intensity, seek wisdom continually or always. It says 2 Corinthians 16.11. It's actually 1, or 1 Chronicles 16.11. You need to mark that so we don't have to get hung up on it. What I'm, what I'm trying to do is to build a case here for you that you can buy into. The case that I'm building is this. Knowledge without wisdom is perilous. Knowledge with wisdom means that God participates in every aspect of our life, bar none. And I'm going to try to make that case from God's Word itself. And that's why if you look carefully, without a, with a couple exceptions, I've given the Scripture for everything that I'm claiming. And I try to do that faithfully anyway. So I'm saying, here's the goal. We want to seek wisdom which equals God's influence as a lifestyle for believers. Now, that's going to be different from what most of us have done most of our life because we have assumed that if I go to church and I make my confession of faith and I'm baptized, I got my ticket to heaven, and that's all that really counts. But I'm here to tell you, 
God didn't save you just to get you into heaven. God saved you with a specifically a specific goal in mind of things for you to do as a citizen of the kingdom of God. He says it this way in the second this is in the second chapter of the book of Ephesians for it is verse 8 and following for it is by grace you've been saved through faith and this is not from yourselves it's a gift from God not by works so that anybody can boast but we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us so there is a work that God has in mind for his people as a group of people, as a congregation of people that he wants us to do. And in order to do that, he has to be the primary influence in our life in every aspect of our life. We can't have any little area over here that we're going to be in charge of and he has no influence on because he's not really God unless he is the most important influence in everything that we say and do. So I'm saying that this should be our lifestyle, and we should make a commitment for that, because we, we're not there yet. We have to begin where we are, though. And we have to accept each other where we are if we can agree on the goal that that's where we want to go. How are you going to do that? Well, if you look carefully in the book of Psalms, and, and it's not only here, it's in a lot of places. If you look in the 119th Psalm, it's really an interesting, uh, it's an, an interesting chapter. It's rather lengthy, to say the least. But in that, uh, in that chapter, he tells us how, what the starting place is for us. Now, if you noticed your outline, there's one word that's everywhere. The one word that's everywhere in your outline is the word seek. Seek. That's our responsibility. God sought us and completed his task, and now he's put the ball in our hands. And you're a Joe Burrow as of today. The ball is in your hands to do with what needs to be done. He says here in verse 10 of that 119th Psalm, I will seek you with all my heart. I will seek you with all my heart. Now, I need to just comment on that. There's a difference between seeking in a laid back way just so that you can say you know it and can quote the scripture. There is, however, what's called obedient faith. And the book of, of Romans starts off with that term and ends with that term in the first chapter and in the 16th chapter. The whole book is wrapped up in these two words, obedience, obedient faith. Because there is a faith that only observes and brags on what they know. This is reading and seeking Wisdom so that you can do it. There's a big difference. Seeking the Lord with all your heart. You see, in the Bible, the word that is translated heart seldom ever is a reference to the pump in your chest. It is used to describe one of four different things and sometimes all of them. The scriptural heart is, and I don't have time to go into the scriptures for each one of these. But the scriptural heart is composed of your intellect, your emotions, your will, and your conscience. Sometimes it's one of these. Sometimes it would be the will. Sometimes it would be your conscience. And sometimes it's all of them. But the, the word cardio, where we get cardiology, so on and so forth, directly refers to one or all of these three things. And so he's saying, seek me with a... It's like, you know, it's like your relationship with your wife. 
is it just kind of platonic and we'll live with each other and get through it until we die and, you know, maybe the kids will be all right, blah, 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 blah. Or is it, some, is, does your wife know that you love her with all your heart? The Bible says that, that that's the man's responsibility. Really. Initiated through the man, and then the wife then is the response to that is that she will support him and be right there with him, help him all the days of their life together. And where that exists, it is a thing of beauty. And so when he says here, hiding the word of God in your heart, what's he talking about? He's in this particular case, he's saying in, when he, in, in verse eleven, I have hidden God's word in my heart that I might not sin against God. That's still here. That's the 11th verse of that 119th Psalm. How do you, so we can't carry this Bible with us wherever we go all day long in, its, in this capacity. But we can learn what's in it. And then the Spirit of God can take the Word of God and turn us into people of God. That's the process. So you will mature into what He wants you to be to the degree that you fill your heart with the Word of God so that the Spirit of God can mold your life so that you begin to think like Jesus. And I'm telling you, there's great security, personal, emotional security, when you know that that's what you're doing. You're not to imp- trying to impress anybody, but, but being honest with, just with God. What I think or somebody else thinks really doesn't matter. Because you don't answer to us. But you will answer to God. And when you know, when you know that in your, with all of your heart, you have sought to know who God is and to know his will, part of the heart. When you know that, there's tremendous security. That's the reason I, I made this reference here in the 37th Psalm, starting verse 23, when he says this. He, what he's talking about here, the security that you have when you seek the Lord with all your heart, God makes some promises to you to help you out. He said, if, if the Lord delights in a man's way, what is that man's way? The, when you're seeking him in every aspect of your life. He makes your steps firm. And though you stumble, and we all do, you'll not fall. In other words, the scripture in another place says, you'll never be tempted beyond what you're able to cope with because of the presence of God to help you. For the Lord, get this, upholds you with the power of his hand. This is the security that you have when you know that you're seeking God's will for the purpose of being an obedient believer. Now, the Catholic Church kind of messed this up because, like all other churches, somewhere along the line, we have a tendency to, to want money more than we want godly people, which is a terrible mistake. And, so what they did was they said, you know, you're baptized. And they believe in baptismal generation. If you're baptized, you know, you're automatically in. But you don't go to heaven based on the fact that you were baptized. You go to heaven based on the works that you do during your life. And there, there's financial rewards for the church because of that theology that I totally reject. So what he's saying here is, is that there isn't a part of your life that God doesn't want to have an influence on. So in order for that to happen, we can no longer, in a nonchalant, laid-back way, seek the Lord. Seeking the Lord with all your heart, to me, means with a degree of intensity that is almost radical. Seek the Lord with all your heart, Jeremiah wrote. And then there's a, here, and the reason I made reference to First Chronicles is because I think that's a really serious 
a statement here. In the 16th chapter, verse 11, when he says, Look to the Lord and his strength. Now, he makes reference to the strength because God has the capacity to do anything that he promises. You and I sometimes make promises we can't keep. Why they say, write a check with your mouth that you can't cash. And we all have a tendency to do that if we're trying to impress somebody. But the Lord makes his promises because he has the capacity to complete them. And so he says, now, but there's an if tied to this. Seek the Lord, seek the face of God always. No exceptions here. And we'll make some specific references in just a minute. Always. Another translation uses the word continually. So is there a point in time in, our, in the decisions that we, have, that we make we need to seek the guidance of God. And there's some parts of our life that for some reason we have not done very well. For instance, even churches, I'm talking about major denominations, have made really, really silly things when it comes to finances because they'll say, you know, this is our responsibility. God, you, you stay out of it. Uncle Floyd was a part of our church here for many years, Floyd Adams. He was kind of an ornery old cuss, but we loved him greatly. And he loved God. And uh, he was a retired Methodist preacher. And he got about $12 a month retirement from them. I'm not exaggerating, just a pittance. But as a result of that, he got their annual report for the retirement funds, which was in the billions. And at that particular time, the apartheid thing in South Africa was headlines. Nobody could ignore it. And in that annual report, I read it. I probably still have a copy somewhere stored away. The Methodist Church were heavily financially involved in companies that operated in South Africa that supported apartheid. Obviously, they hadn't sought God's will on where the, what they did with their finances. I'm telling you, God needs to be, I, I, you know, there for a long time, I had uh, some stock, and I haven't done very well in the last month or so. You may have to feed me. I had some stock called Alibaba, and I bought it at like $50, and it went to 310 or I forget what, I, and I sold it when I found out that the Chinese communist government were treating some sect of Islam people the same way that the Boers, that the German Dutch were, had been treating the people in South Africa. I'm not mad at the Chinese, but I'm mad at their government, the communist government. And I'll not own anything that in any way is connected with them if I can help it. Even though, if I had a pile of money right now to buy that stuff, you could get rich pretty quick because it's, it's been knocked way down. What I'm saying is this. God wants you to know there's no part of your life that he doesn't want to have a say-so in it. Do you pray when you make your investments? Do you seek his face when you make his investments? Because the two areas that we have a tendency to separate out and say, this is my responsibility, this is my activity, God, you take a hike, has to do with our sex life and our money. I don't think I'm exaggeration when I say when I was a kid growing up in metropolitan Germantown, Kentucky, I don't think there was a single person in our church there, a couple hundred people on a regular basis, 
a single person in that church that was living, a man living with a woman they weren't married to. Were there some adulterous situations? Yeah, there were. But it's gotten continually worse. And in many churches, people who are just accepted as whatever, who are living in an adulterous relationship, they take communion, da-da-da-da-da. We are complacent when it comes to dealing with flagrant sin. And, and this book that we're looking at here talks about that. It tells us to look at. One of, the, one of the things that we talk about here often is the ultimate goal of any serious-minded Christian should be to mature in our faith to the place where the character qualities of Jesus can be seen in us. That's the goal. That's what the Apostle Paul meant, and he wasn't any different from any of the rest of us. He was a flagrant sinner and had been a murderer, for heaven's sakes, who said, but my ultimate goal in life is this, for me to live is what? Can you say Christ? For me to live is what? Boy, there are not many of you want to get there. But that's the ultimate goal. That the character qualities of Jesus, which is the fruit of the Spirit mentioned in the book of Galatians, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, so on, he says, those character qualities of Jesus are to be seen in us, but they'll only get there, folks, if and when we seek him with all of our heart. It's not automatic just because you've been dipped in water. The only thing that's automatic when you're dipped in water is you're wet. And understand, the reason I'm saying this is because God equals wisdom, and Jesus was God in the flesh. So when we seek to be intimate with Jesus Christ, to it can be said, we're in Christ, is the word that's used in Scripture. And he's in us. Jesus is actually referred to in the New Testament in several different places. And I've only put a couple down there. In 1 Corinthians, because it's easier for me to find here, and it's in Colossians 2. But in the first chapter of 1 Corinthians, Jesus is actually referred to by the Apostle Paul. as the embodiment of wisdom. Why? Because he's God in the flesh. Here's the way that it reads. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God. Christ is the embodiment of wisdom. Wisdom is that which you can use as God's influence on your knowledge in order to glorify Him. And, and, and the ultimate goal of every believer as, spend, as spelled out in Scripture is this, that our life brings glory to God. All of us. Not just some hairy-legged preacher. David spells out how this is to be accomplished when you go back and look at what he wrote in the Psalms. If you look, for instance, in the 63rd Psalm, he talks about how this works. He is an example, just like us. David was a flawed person. He was consumed by wine, women, and song. But he had one thing about him that God honored and he saw this coming from the time that he was a child. He writes it this way in the first verse of the 63rd Psalm. Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly 
do I seek you? The key word there, earnestly, which literally means with intensity, I will seek you, God. And he goes on to say, my soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you. If there's anything that a man longs for in his life that you can understand is that his woman will long for him. You use that same matter of intensity and apply it to our relationship with the living God and you got a picture of what it's supposed to be like. As he participates in every aspect of our life. And David says, I earnestly seek him. I long for him. And the Bible, I think, clearly states that the Lord puts a protection, a hedge around those who, who really seriously seek Him. Now, that doesn't mean we're not going to grow old and die. It doesn't mean that we'll be free from temptation. Jesus was tempted in every matter, just like we were, the Bible says. That doesn't mean we cease to be fully human and, and face all of those things and sometimes fail. It means that the number one thing in our life that we're even noted for is seeking God to participate in every aspect of our life. Oh, how I wish that the day would come when all of our teenagers would seek the Lord about where they should go to school, what they should do with their life, and how it can glorify God. The Bible tells us here in this text, by the way, and I'm just going to use a couple of verses to save time because time gets away from me in my advanced years. He's two things here where he says that God will actually look out for you and protect you. Two things. He actually uses the word in the NIV text of the word save. I think rescue would might be better, but the concept is the same. He says that since God is the embodiment of wisdom, is, is wise, and Jesus is the embodiment of wisdom, you seek God through Christ Jesus. If you're in Christ, you're in God. So this wisdom that comes from seeking God with all your heart says this, wisdom will save you from the wicked ways of Influences of wicked men. Now he didn't quit there. So okay, we're talking about primarily things having to do with money. If you read through the rest of the book. Then, it, then when you drop down to verse 14, he says, And it, meaning wisdom, will save you from wicked women or the adulteress. And let me tell you something I've learned in life. I've learned to listen to my wife when it comes to the way women behave. Because I will admit I'll soon be 85 years old and I still don't understand them. And I've just given up. I just asked her. There was a situation even here at church where she said a long time ago, that woman is laying a trap for this guy. Uh, yeah, okay. Jealous women, you don't pay attention to them. Two or three months later, guess what? The trap had snapped too, and he'd been had. I didn't know my wife was a prophetess until then. And so there is, there is that wickedness that we need protection from even in the church. Because we have women who come here looking for men, and we've had men coming here looking for women. That's happened often. Because you see, in the church, they can't run very well. They got them trapped. They're wicked. And the Scripture says that God will help you. Now, how is He going to do that? How can He keep this 
this woman who thinks about three miles ahead of most men on how she's going to snap the track. Because the women make these decisions. Men just think they do. How are we going to... I'm convinced of this. I'm convinced that when you seek the Lord with all your heart, and especially in your relationships to money and to women or for women, for men, that God gives us insight through the Holy Spirit to protect us where we can see the fraudulent movement of evil. In the New Testament, it's called the gift of discernment. And I'm convinced that the Holy Spirit gives us, when we seek Him with all of our heart, with a degree of intensity that at times is uncomfortable, when we seek Him with that intensity, He then, and we, we draw nigh unto Him, and His promise then is to draw nigh unto earth, us. He gives us that sense of, watch out. What about a women? Oh, I'm just being a smart aleck. Go ahead. Okay. To save you and help keep us out of trouble. Because sexual desires, especially in young men, and for old men to dream about, is really strong at times. And you look at the television and it's advertising all of these pills that you can take that will make you think you're a teenage stud when you're just wilting down as an old man. But not the promises. And this one, this one black guy that was a really great athlete, he comes on and he winks and he says, and the women will like it too. You know? it's, it's a great ad. And it's influential. But it leads us to believe something that we have to be careful with. Dirty old men are just that. Now, let, let's end with this. I've tried to make my case that God's goal for those who come to Christ is more than just getting to heaven. It's to be his primary influence here in life as we live it on a day-to-day -day basis. And nothing short of that. He wants to be involved in our finances. And, and don't you think God has a better insight into the stock market than we do? So why wouldn't we seek his face? The Bible is very clear that God will reward those who seek his face. With intensity. He, he rewards those seekers. And the, and the chapter and the verse that I appreciated more than any other is in the book of Hebrews. It's in the 11th chapter. And the 11th chapter of Hebrews is made up of a list of the Old Testament saints that God specially picked out as being special. That's redundant speech, but that's what he did. Listen to this. Because it just kind of drives a nail in pulls together what I've been trying to say in one verse. He starts off in verse 6 and saying this, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. That's the starting point. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. And then he says, and this is what faith is. He goes ahead and makes it clear. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists. Number one. So you believe in God. That's the beginning of faith. And the way, by the word, the word believe and the word faith has the same root. Pistuo is a Greek form of the word that is translated both believe and faith. It is impossible to please God without faith because anyone who comes to him must believe that he is. Number two, and he is a rewarder of them 
who seek him with diligence. What's the operative term here? Diligence. What does, the word, what does diligence mean? Diligence can also be translated earnestness, sincerity, intensity. God isn't, com- he isn't happy with people who are complacent believers. In the book of Revelation, he actually condemns a church full of people like that by saying, I wish you were either hot or cold, but you're lukewarm. And you make me sick. That's literally what he says. Isaiah told the Israel, you better get on on with it too. Because God doesn't always strive with men. He put it this way. He said, seek him while he is near. See, that promise goes back to, if you draw near unto God, he'll do what? He'll draw near to us. So we're coming together. Well, what if we mess up? Because sooner or later, we all do. We've got that promise that, you know, his hand is beneath us. If we're seeking him with diligence, we may stumble, but we ain't going to fall. Because he's there to give us the hand. And sooner or later, we all do. We all do, because we're what? We're fallen We're fallen people. We're incapable of perfection. But our goal should be excellence. So what do you do? He says this. Acknowledge your guilt. Now that doesn't mean you stand up here before church and tell all the ornery stuff that's come through your mind or that you might have done in your life. You did away with that when you were baptized. That's done. Now that you stumble after you become a Christian, what do you do then? You take it to God and you acknowledge your guilt. David did that often. Oh God, you are my God, bud. Here's where I messed up. He had an eye for the women. I'm glad I'm partially blind. Partially. Acknowledge him and then do what? He said in Hosea. Hosea is is the story of Israel committing spiritual adultery. And yet God, who is always faithful, keeps extending his hand because you're my people. Jesus actually summed it up this way in the 11th chapter. It's recorded in the 11th chapter, Luke verse 9. He said, If you seek, and here the intensity is implied by the Greek text, you'll find him. So we're not searching in the dark. We're searching and seeking with the promise of God that if you look for me with intensity, you will find me. And I'm telling you, you'll never know how comforting it is To know that even when you aren't thinking about him, he's there. A breath away. Seek him with intensity. So let's you and I agree that we want to give this a whirl. And let's encourage each other along the way. Rather than judge each other when when you see an obvious failure. Listen, when you get knocked to your knees, it's really comforting to have someone reach down and lift you up. And Christians, if we love each other, are lifter-uppers and encouragers. For even Jesus said, I came not into the world to condemn the world, but that they may be saved. And salvation here is more than getting to heaven. It's freedom from wicked influences, freedom from wicked women or men. Seeking the Lord with diligence and intensity brings marvelous rewards because the day is coming when you and I are going to die. 
And when you lie on that deathbed, knowing that it's near, that you're lucky enough to be in that state, is it going to matter how much money you made? Is it really going to matter how popular you were? I think the only thing that matters then is I have sought the Lord and he's here with me. And in a minute or two, I'll see him face to face. That's called the gospel. Good news. Father, we ask you to give us the courage and the prodding of your Holy Spirit for us to seek your face with intensity. Welcome your presence continually so that beyond the limitations of our flesh we can glorify you beautifully. That's my prayer in Jesus' name. And all the people said, Amen. God bless you. You're free to go. Christ Community meets on Saturday at 5 p.m. and Sunday at 10.30 a.m. For more information, visit www.christcommunity.net or check out our Facebook page.